welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry with me, Alia. And it's good to be with you today to have this teaching which we are going to do. And I know that I haven't done teaching for a long time. It's been very, very busy. And I'm really, really looking forward to sharing the revelation of this teaching and of this truth with you. As the Father has been sharing it with me over time. And I've just really been sitting with Him and just receiving into my heart so that I could really share with you. And so I'm really, really excited. Welcome, welcome if you're joining this teaching for the first time. Welcome if you've been with me before and you've listened to so many of the women's teachings. And I'm really, really incredibly blessed because there are so many people whose lives have been touched through hearing and knowing the stories of the woman in the Bible and the scriptures from a very different perspective, as we need to know more of these stories, not just the ones that we often talk about that that are well known, but also the stories of the lesser known women who are there and were incredibly powerful and influential. And this evening, that's what we're going to be looking at. Somebody, in fact, three people who are there in prison, but I've never ever heard about them and I've never heard somebody teach on them before. So hopefully this teaching is going to be one of many. Let us just close our eyes before we begin and let us just pray together. Father, we just want to praise you and glorify your name, Yeshua Mashiach. We know that you love us so, so, so much. And that, Father, you desire to go so deep with us. Father, this evening, we just commit our hearts, we commit our lives to you. We open up every single part of ourselves to you. And Yeshua, we pray that you'll come and wash us clean. Give us the strength that we need for each and every single day. Father, protect us in the power and the palm of your hand, Yeshua. And Yeshua, I also pray this evening for a blessing upon me, Father Yahweh, as I just share your word, Abba Father, that you would just lead and guide me, and that Father, you will bless those who hear, bless their ears, bless their hearts, and bless every part of them, Father. And may this teaching carry with it a message, Father, not only for us to know these people, Father, or to know that they lived, but Father, may this teaching carry a message for our hearts in this generation. We thank you for that, and we give you all the glory, all the praise. Yeshua Mashiach, we pray this in your mighty, mighty name. Amen. So this evening, it is evening by me, so I'm going to be saying evening, but if it's morning by you, it's morning. But this evening, we are going to be looking at who were David's sisters and who was his mother. You know, um, quite a while back, I received th- this a, a question, and it was about who is David's mother. And, you know, it's a very important question. And I've been asked a number of questions um, before about people that we read about in the scriptures who were who was their mothers and who who were their sisters, you know, who were their siblings, what's actually going on here. And during the same time that I received this question about who is David's mother, someone else asked it somewhere and I happened to read it. And I thought, you know, we need to look at who this is. But not only, you know, did you know David, he's just such a, a, a this this figure that appears in history especially biblical history and and this, you know our our connection with looking at who are the, the deeply righteous spiritual figures in in the scriptures and david appears as this he appears as as a very big figure and um, there are so many lessons that we can learn from his life but he's he's this spiritual figure that we remember David the shepherd boy who becomes king who becomes king and he's truly he dominates our thoughts in just so many ways and we see him we see this ragged handsome boy alone in the field when Samuel comes in and anoints him we see that he's not with his family we see him out in the field we see that he and here that he's killed a lion and he's killed a bear we see David anointed we see him blessed you know we see him defeating Goliath the giant we hear him playing music for Saul we hear his him and his first love because he loves Saul's daughter Michal we hear about that and we we follow David into a Cave, and we follow him into the wilderness and into Hebron and, and we follow him finally into the city of David where he rules. We we hear him getting the ark back and, and you know killing the people and then we know about Bathsheba and we know about Solomon and we hear about the rebellion of Absalom and we hear so much about him and he he's 
his life is one of the most detailed lives of scripture and he's so he, of course he dominates our mindsets and he dominates what we know from scripture and it's wonderful that we have all that wisdom and insight into his life but what we also know is that David grew up in a home of course he grew up in a household full it was just not the home of his dad who we know was Jesse or Yeshai we also know he had Jesse had eight sons now that depends where you're going to be looking in scripture you know it's some one place it says eight another it says seven we're going to go with eight here we know that you know David was then surrounded by a lot of brothers we also know that he grew up there in a home with a matriarch with a with a woman who was his mother Yeshai's wife we don't know her name which we'll get into later but we know that he had a wife and now we also know from scripture which is what we're going to dive into today is that David had two sisters and they played a vital role in what was happening and what happens in David's later life and not just in his life but you know for the nation so David grows up with brothers and with sisters and it's it's interesting to see how this whole thing unfolds. So we need to ask ourselves, first and foremost, our starting point needs to be, who were David's sisters? Who were they? What were their names? And if I had to ask that of you right now, before you get into this teaching or you've read the notes, who was David's sisters? Who were they and what were their names? Well, before I did this, I could not tell you. I definitely could not tell you who they were, but scripture does tell us who they were 1 chronicles 2 13 to 16 that's where we find them i'm going to give you the introduction to them it says this jesse was the father of Eliab, his firstborn the second son was abinadab the third was shimei the fourth was nathaniel the fifth radai the sixth ozem and the seventh david their sisters were zeruiah and abigail zeruiah's three sons were abishai joab and asahel Abigail was the mother of Amasa, whose father was Jether, the Ismaelite. Well, now we have a lot of information that we need to dissect, okay? Because we have all these different men that are named, and these are all David's brothers. And then it says, here are their sisters, Zeruiah and Abigail. So that's their names. Have you ever heard of them before? Because before I did this, like I say... I never heard of them before, but they actually play a very important role in scripture. How have you ever heard of their names that were mentioned in this genealogy? Well, the fact that their names are, are there, and I'm going to say it again, and I say it in many of the teachings that I do, the fact that their names are mentioned in a genealogy testifies to their influence and testifies to their power. It testifies to who they were. And as you know, they actually birthed the commanders of David's warrior army. We know that David had mighty men. He had 300, he had 30, and then he had three. And you need to know about these women because they're going to play a super, super important role in David's warrior army. And I hope that you are really excited to discover their value because they really, really are incredibly valuable and their legacies are rich and their stories in their lives are rich so Zeruiah is mentioned first she's mentioned first in the recanting of David's genealogy and this more than likely indicates her status as the firstborn sister in the family her name is mentioned first now this is this is important Zeruiah's sons are always mentioned with the metronymic son of Zeruiah okay so their identity and their status is wrapped up with their mom not with the dad the dad is not even mentioned in Zeruiah's case you know their identity is wrapped up with her and although we know a little about her what we do know is that her children are identified as belonging to her so her children are identified as belonging to her not her husband and it would therefore appear that she is a woman of influence in her own rights why do I say that okay Matronymic, okay, is a, a very, very important word that we need to just pause at and we need to think about, okay? It means firstly that a son or daughter that is born to a woman is given her name. In other words, it's compiling someone's name, like surnaming. Today it would be me having a child and I'm married and I give my child my name. 
uh, or my surname and my child is recognized as belonging to me and where my child is in society my child is recognized as belonging to Aaliyah that is Aaliyah's child and there is this 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 way and even in our society today when that does happen I'm talking about in our western society there are many different tribes and groups that actually have the metronymic meaning in their lives still today but in our western society we usually when couples get married a lot of times the the husband's name is taken on that's not a metronymic that's a patronymic name but the metronymic means that you're identifying a son or a daughter with the mother which means even today that if that is the case it must mean that the person that you're referring to has a high status and is well known and has a big influence so in this case you know Israel there are traces of a matronymic reality in ancient Israel that goes on and on throughout the scripture that's a whole different topic for a completely different day but Zeruiah has children, three sons, and they are identified with her. It shows her influence. It shows her influence in the family, and it shows that she has power in her society. She is obviously well known. She has a power within her kin. She's not mentioned, and this is what I want to say. Some people could say, okay, well, you know, Zeruiah is just mentioned here because she's a sister of David. That's not what's happening here because she's David's sister. She's referred to as the sister of all of them, not just David. She's mentioned here with all of her siblings, including her other sister. So it would seem that it's because of her own character and her own reputation. And her children, if you look and find her name, her name appears a number of times throughout Scripture. And every time you find her name, she's coupled with her children and her children are called by her name me and even when David he speaks about the sons of Zeruiah he could call them the name he could say Joab you know but he says Joab son of Zeruiah he's identifying who Joab is and they are identified Joab was identified and we're going to go into Joab was now Joab was identified by his mother which shows you and you need to expand your way of thinking this is not simple it's not a simple thing to go oh son of so-and-so it's telling you something it's telling you something that's deeper than what we can see it's telling you that here's a woman who's who's got a, a reputation of influence and power in, among her kin and in society in general so much so that her children are walking around being called by her name it's very, very important. So who were her children? Well, her ch children were very important. Abishai, Joab, and Asahel were the superheroes of their day. They were seriously superheroes of the day. They were strong. They were powerful. They were nephews to the king. And each one of them lived a life of service to their uncle, to King David. They lived a life of service. We, If you read your Bible often, you will see Joab. He comes in a lot of times and his character is very very interesting but he was for many years the commander or the general of David's vast armies so Zeruiah's son Joab is a commander of the armies he fought the Ammonites he obeyed his uncle in placing Bathsheba's husband Uriah in the front lines he killed his cousin Amasa and uh, he as well as he kills David's rebellious son he was incredibly strong uh, Psalm 60 actually talks about his might as a soldier of him actually slaughtering going out and and in the slaughter of 12,000 people he was incredibly incredibly strong and powerful and he he had uh, wisdom and he had wit and he he you know he did a lot of things in scripture if you look at him he orchestrates David's reconciliation with Absalom in a very very you know kind of deceitful kind of slash witty way and um, he also then eventually though kills Absalom even though David told him not to so Joab is a very complex character and uh, on his deathbed David actually urged his son Solomon to exact justice against Joab you know he says Solomon you know you need to take care of Joab because Joab killed Amasa and he killed Abner which is quite sad if you think about it because a lot of these people that we're going to be looking at today are related, all of them. So Joab was David's nephew. And David's nephew was the commander of his army for many, many years. And, you know, Joab eventually was killed by Solomon, 
who's you know, David's son. And so they're all related. Joab isn't this outsider that's leading an army. He's the nephew. He's David's nephew. And, you know, he leads the army. He's very strong. And eventually, though, he does get killed by Solomon. And we also have Asahel, who is Zeruiah's other son. He was a commander of a legion of 24,000 men. Wow. In David's army. And he was killed by Saul's commander after an intense battle at Gibeon. So we know that Asahel was another commander. Again, here we have a mighty, mighty man, a strong man, a powerful man. And he was eventually killed in, in war in a battle with Saul. And it says, it actually says about him in 2 Samuel 2.18. It says the three sons of Zeruiah, there we have it again, were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asael. And Asael was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. So in other words, he could run very fast. He was probably very athletic, and he was so, so nimble on his feet. Then we have Abishai. Now, Abishai was another one of her three sons, and he became a military leader. He fought alongside his brother Joab again. He fought in the final showdown against Absalom. And in 2 Samuel 18, one to two it says this David sent out his troops a third under the command of Joab a third under Joab's brother Abishai son of Zeruiah there we have it again and a third under Ittai the Gittite the king told the troops I myself will surely march out with you so Abishai displayed incredible courage on the battlefield we have a third of the troops under the command of Joab who is the army commander in general but then another third of the troops gets placed under Abishai's control and so he here again we have a strong mighty man all of Zeruiah's sons are warriors all of them are working hard in the kingdom they are you know serving in this vast vast army of thousands of men but they're not only serving in the army they're not just a foot soldier they are commanders they are leaders and they're powerful they you know the, all those movies we, we love to watch the the robin hoods and the the brave hearts and the king arthurs well these were those guys these were the strong knights these were the strong fighters these were the warriors these were the hardcore guys and they were all recognized in their own right but also called by their mother's name it must have been it must have been something it really really must have been something because we have them and they're strong and they're mighty but they're also leading armies they're also daily putting their lives online and that must have been hard so each one of Zeruiah's children was skilled in a different area. Okay, so remember, Joab was the commander army, but Asahel, we have, is different. He was athletic and he could run very fast, but he was killed. And what they shared in common, though, even though they were skilled differently, was that they had a mother who raised him to be mighty in their generation. Zeruiah and her sister Abigail, now think about this for a moment. They had been brought up in a family with brothers who fought in Saul's army. Remember when David defeats Goliath, he's actually there to check out how his brothers are doing by his father's command saying, let, let me know how they are. Let me know what's going on. So that's why David is there. And Zuria and, and Abigail brought, were brought up in this family of these men who fought in Saul's army. Their brother David became the warrior king of Israel. His hands were stained with so much blood that he was not permitted even to build the temple of Elohim. You know, in, in both Zuria's and Abigail's life, their children served in their brother's army. Both of them gave their children to the army and war and bloodshed were a part of their lives, their everyday lives. And the uncertainty that comes with long campaigns away, with vicious armies, it really must have made their, their hearts weary at times. It doesn't matter if we saying, well, it was different back then. It's ancient Israel and there was a lot going on. There was war all the time. It doesn't matter. You know, we are told that these are women, these are moms mother's hearts don't change yes our circumstances can can change and can alter but yet the love for a child does not change and i wonder if they ever shared their pain with each other i wonder if if they they were acquainted with worry and with with wondering what what's going on with their children what's happening and war is hard for anybody if you read any war stories or war poetry or anything it is hard it is hard for the people involved and it's hard for the people on the outside who are waiting for that return and who are waiting for your life 
to be spared. And that's how it was for Zaria and for Abigail, that they were women that birthed these mighty men. And still, they were moms and they had to give them up. And still, they had influence and power in their own right. So Abigail is another one, is David's other sister. And First Chronicles tells us the name of Abigail's husband. It says that he was a non-Israelite, he was an Ishmaelite, and his name was Jether. Now, Jether must have been a person of worth or rank because he gets named. Zaria's husband does not get named but Jethro does get named because there's a wonderful thing that Richard says in the Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary he says that Hebrew genealogies often included only the names of people who have some significance for future generations wow that is amazing because even if you pause at that and you look at it and you say okay Zeruya is named and Abigail are named it means that they have some significance for a future generation they have significance to us because they're showing us something and you know Abigail's son Amasa is named with her he's called by her name again he's shown to be of her family and of her kin so again her influence is powerful her legacy is whispering through this tight genealogy and her, and her actions that you know her actions are unknown to us we don't know her legacy but Amasa was led astray that, that was one thing that we do know. Amasa is again, you know, David's nephew. But what happens is Amasa is led astray. He joins Absalom's rebellion. And Absalom places Amasa as the commander general of his army. And when Absalom's finally defeated though, which is a crazy thing, David makes Amasa head over his army in place of Joab. And then Joab is very angry, of course, and they are actually cousins. And Joab and Amasa are cousins because they're both nephews of David. And uh, Joab follows Amasa and he kills him. And that is part of why David tells Solomon that he has to kill Joab because Joab kills innocent people. And that's not right. And so here again, how intense must this have been? Zeruiah's son, Joab, kills her sister's son, Amasa. And they're women and they're sharing one another's burdens for their families. And and here we have this. Joab's killing Amasa. This is this is not right. This is unjust. You know, David's family history actually reads like something of a modern day soap opera. You have infighting, you have rebellion, you have murder intrigues, you have crazy things that are happening, you have the people trying to overthrow each other, people killing each other. It is so hard sometimes to understand the decisions that they made or the thoughts behind the actions. And that's what people say. It's difficult to understand. Why did they do the things that they did? And even though it's difficult to understand, we know that the scriptures were not given to us with all the details added. We only are given what we need to know. And most of what's behind the scenes and what's happening is obviously left out. It's not a novel, so we don't know the, the dialogue. We don't know the thought. What does matter, though, in this instance is that David had two sisters. Both of them are named and both reveal a powerful matriarchal presence far beyond what we know and understand today. We can only imagine their words. We can only imagine their emotions. We can only imagine the pain at the infighting that was happening with the family or the killings that eventually took the lives of their children. And their children all meet these these deaths because, of course, war and killing is what was happening in those those times. And it must have been difficult, really, really difficult f for them as well. But also I believe that they were that they knew a lot more than what we knew and understand today of their time and what was happening. And so they were powerful and they, they displayed courage, I'm sure. And so now we need to turn and ask ourselves the question that was asked is, who is David's mother? And David's mother has long been a mystery to many people. And the reason why she's a mystery is because, you know, Jesse, Yeshai, he is named in the scripture, along with all of his children, his children are named, but the woman who nurtured and birthed his children and birthed King David, her name is left out of the scripture readings, this happens often. And um, it happens quite a lot of the time. Even Samson's mother, whom the angel of Yahweh chose to appear to twice, didn't even appear to, didn't choose to appear to her husband. She's not even named. 
And um, as I've said before, this has got to do with the the scribe, the person who wrote these things down. And, you know, woman's history at that time wasn't important. And that is why it needs to be resurrected. And that's why it is being resurrected. But due to her unnamed absence, a lot of myth and a lot of story has evolved about David's mother's life. And to make matters worse, you know, Second Samuel identifies David's sister Abigail as the daughter of a man named Nahash and that's in 2 Samuel 17 25 and um, I just this is just a slight introduction which I'm not going to even bring up on the screen because we're only and that's my thing I'm only going to give you what the scripture says we're not taking anything out of context scripture we're not going to place conjecture or our opinion or thought on this we're only going to look at scripture but what I just want to say in this little brief introduction to her is that because David's sister Abigail has been identified or was identified in 2nd Samuel as the daughter of Nahash many rabbis believe that Nahash means serpent in Hebrew which it does it does mean serpent and they believe that it was another name for Jesse and that his alternate name was being used here now obviously that's just conjecture there's no evidence to prove that some rabbis think that other rabbis suggest that Nahash was actually married to David's mother first before she married Jesse and that she had an affair while being married to Jesse again highly unlikely and we'll see why just now this understanding appears in the Jewish Midrashic text and I want to just add because there's been a big thing lately that's come up that there are a number of pastors and preachers particularly in South Africa who are using David's mother and her alleged Jewish Midrashic affair um, to really preach forgiveness after adultery and to speak about all these things in order to cover up their own lives and it's completely wrong and it's completely without merit and it's pure speculation because it would also implicate that David was a man born from adulterous affair which is what many say and they they would suggest that and then they this would go severely against the line of Yeshua because Yeshua is born into a particular line and if this was the case it would severely go against that line it's what what seems more likely here and what a lot of scholars do suggest and people who are really looking into the scripture what they suggest and it's it's true we need to we realize that within parts of first chronicles and second chronicles even for example and even here is that there are textual copyist errors in other words that the scribe that was copying and was writing this out made a textual error you know and um, this happens there are they would say um, parts of the text are corrupt and this does happen you'll find it in first and second chronicles often because remember that was a copying and sometimes the scribe can be tired and he, he's you know your eyes you're copying so much stuff that your eyes can flip things around and this seems to be what happened here because verse 27 of the same chapter of second samuel refers to a man just underneath this is refers to a man who was the son of nahash an ammonite and it would appear that verse 25 where they talk about abigail daughter of nahash it would just appear that verse 25 carries this error because verse 25 says abigail daughter of nahash one one verse down and it says oh and there was a man who was a son of nahash and ammonite so it would seem that it's an error so the copyists of the text wrote nahash instead of yeshai jesse within the text as then these two names if you look at them in the hebrew they appear with similar similar lettering not in english obviously nahash and jesse are very different in english but if you look at it in hebrew there are similar letters in there and it's just an error abby Abigail was not the daughter of Nahash, but the daughter of Jesse, and um, her mom did not have an adulterous, licentious affair, and and would have tainted the line of of the one who was to come. And you know, we need to just really um, separate truth from error. And there's a lot of people who are running with this false doctrine, and it's it's not right. So we need to ask ourselves. For the purpose of this study, we're only going to stick to what we know from Scripture about David's mother because Scripture in this context is safe. We're not going to go outside of that. We're going to look at what's safe. So let's look at her connection to her relation with David, but also then who she was. And one of the places where we find out truly about who she was is actually Psalm one. 
116 verse 16. It says, and David is writing, he says, Truly, I am your servant, Yahweh. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. Wow. In the ESV, it says, Oh, Yahweh, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosened my bonds. This is one of the only places where we discover the power and the influence of David's mom. And Psalm 116 is actually a very beautiful declaration of worship, of thanksgiving and of love. And it expresses David's thankfulness to Abba Father's protection, his deliverance, his mercy. And also gives us a glimpse into his mother's walk with the Almighty. Isn't that so, so sweet? It's actually really, really sacred. And in verse 16, David declares his own servanthood before Yahweh. And then he adds his faith in the Almighty, with the faith of his mother. Because the word for servant here, maid servant here, is the Hebrew word amah, A-M-A-H, amah. And it's a very rare word. It's not often used and found in scripture, but David uses it here. And and it, it echoes out his conviction that just as my mother served you faithfully, Yahweh, and she committed her ways to you and she was your servant, your bond servant. So too, I'm committing myself to a walk of servanthood before you. This is showing you a woman of deep generational faith. We can conclude from the simple phrase that David was a man nurtured from the faithfulness and from the example that his mother set for him. She believed in God, she served God, she walked in truth humbly, she committed her way, she was faithful in her commitment. And David asserts here in a prayer, so he's not lying, he's not telling a fib, he's not trying to, to, you know, twist the Almighty's arm. He's saying, he's declaring truth and he's saying, just as my mother walked before you, just as she was faithful to you, just as she took a position of a servant, so too I will take, Yahweh, I will take my position as a servant because my mother was. She taught me how. And maybe that's why David was different. Who knows? Maybe his mother was his teacher. And you know, according to modern practice, when Jewish people today pray for sick individuals, if you're sitting in the synagogue and you have a sick individual, um, they add the mother's name to the name of the individual. So for example, if there's someone I know and her name is Sarah, I say, uh, Sarah, what's her mother's name? Sure, it has to be the mother's name. So it'll be Sarah Bat Esther, for example, or Bat Rachel, whatever. Whatever it is, they do this. They add the person's name to the mom's name because they do this because, do you know why? Because of Psalm 116 verse 16. Because of David's words right here about his devoted mom. Judaism really holds to the fact that a person's spiritual essence is inherited from his or her mother. And so therefore Judaism is a religion that that they believe, as we all know, that is inherited from your mom. And so that this is part of why. Because yeah, they're saying that David inherited his spiritual essence and his deep commitment because he had a mother who reflected a deep faith and a deep commitment herself and so it, it really testifies to who she was again psalm 86 verse 16 actually again it, you know it's almost identical to this david is serving at him in the same way and he's he's calling out again and he says he says yahweh i am your servant just as my mother was in psalm 86 16 so here we have our second, only second, but very last glimpse of who we see David's mother was. And it says this, this is the only other scriptural evidence we have to to show who she was and of her commitment to David and his commitment to her. It said this, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Abdullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. 
Here we have a scene where this is one of those parts of David's life where he's on the move and he's running like a criminal from a bloodthirsty king from King Saul. And in his running, he escapes to a cave and he hides in the wilderness because David had nowhere to go. It would also seem that he was alone and he was desperate. We know that he wrote Psalm 142 which is an amazing psalm, and Psalm 57. They are, these are both psalms of lament, psalms that are very, very much about the depth of discouragement and despair and of need. And he's writing them in this cave, and he's praying for salvation. He's praying for safety. He's praying in, in about anxiety and sorrow and how to deal with the unknown and, 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 and a lack of vision because I'm hunted and I could be killed. And just as David is pouring out his heart before him, this wonderful thing happens. He looks up from this cave, from the wilderness. He sees his mother. He sees his father. He sees his brothers. He sees them all standing at the entrance of this place. And I wonder, you know, so much so, I wonder if his mother didn't, you know, nudge, nudge old Jesse and be like, you know, our, our son David, he is a worthy man and we need to, to go and be with him. Because, you know, Jesse, when Samuel came, he didn't think that David was very worthy to be seated with Samuel. You know, he was outside and all the other brothers were inside. He didn't see that David was, you know, needed enough in that position. So what made his heart change? Perhaps it was the devotion and, and the faithfulness of David's mother. Perhaps she, you know, we know that she loved Elohim from how David testifies about her. He's, he's, you know, telling us about her, testifying to her life, testifying to her great faith. And perhaps she was a mother who really loved and convinced her family that her son needed them. And with the comfort of his family, David's future was uncertain. But they must have been comfort. And then we see men and women are gathering to him. And, you know, he's got all these people now that are gathering to him. But even in the midst of this, he he knows that he has to leave this cave. Um, Elohim doesn't want him to stay there. Yahweh doesn't want him to stay there. And he has to march into an uncertain world and an uncertain future. And that 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 is that is hard. That was hard for him because even in the scriptures I read to you in one Samuel twenty two, he says, I need to learn eventually what, what God will do for me. So he's basically saying, I don't know what this holds for me. I don't know what is coming. But I have to see what Elohim holds for me. And you know, that speaks to me this evening because sometimes the things that we we you know, we don't know. We don't always know. We don't always have a clear vision or a clear future. And it can seem like we're in that cave and we, we could be in that place. And we just don't know. But David said, I'll have to see what Elohim will do for me. Because he then knew and understood that it didn't matter what was coming whatever would come would be part of Elohim's plan your hands are not in the lives of a man your hands are not in the lives of people your hands are in the lives of an almighty uh, your life is sorry your life is in the hands of an almighty king and he's going to have the last say on your life and I pray that that will encourage you that he's going to have the last say and he's going to have the last say for me and I'm speaking to myself. He's going to have the last say. But even in with David's uncertainty, he does this amazing thing. You know, so strong was his concern for his parents that he traveled to Mizpah in Moab. And he requested that royalty offer safe refuge to them. This is not a random act. This may seem like he's just doing something. This is not random. This is a very well thought out plan. Because Ruth was David's great-grandmother and she was a Moabite. And the Moabites were not on the side of Saul at all. You know, this would mean that David is is gonna is is appealing to royalty, but appealing to someone that was once family, and he's also appealing to people that are not for Saul. These people are not for Saul. With the king, David was assured of his parents' safety, even as his own hung in the balance. You know, this is not just about honoring your parents. Some people would love to turn to scripture and say, you see, David's fulfilling the commandments by honoring your parents. Yes, in a way. 
but a person wouldn't go out on a limb just to honor in such a way. He's doing something because I believe that he was concerned for his parents. So he he's working with deep love, with deep care and deep concern. He has to kiss his parents goodbye and he has to leave to pursue God's unknown calling at the utterance of Gad the prophet. Gad the prophet came to David and said, you can't sit in this cave anymore. You've got to do something more. And Elohim is calling you to do something more. And these two moments right here when David says goodbye, well, I wonder how that must have felt. This this moment here and the one before where David's writing in the psalm about his mother's faith, you know, almost like testifying to who she was. We see that there is faith. This is what we see. We see faith. We see commitment. We see care. We see concern. And we see love. And whoever David's mother was, she had birthed a great deal of children, as we know. She had served God faithfully and she had nurtured her son with faith. Far from being that adulterous woman that many people want to talk about because of their own stuff, she was a woman who gave birth to Yahweh's chosen king. And he was a man after Elohim's own heart. And that we know. She was also a woman then who was in the line of Yeshua, the ultimate king who would come. And we know that because it's not just a man that gives birth to a child, it's women that give birth to children. And so here we have this, this love, this care, this commitment. Here we have David's sisters who are women of power and influence in their own right. And we see the infighting of their children. We see the struggle of a family. We see all these different, you know, kin relationships unfolding. And like my mom often says, what is a normal family? You know, there's a lot of ways where we talk about the abnormalities of family and this one does that. And it seems so strange. But here we, we see all of David's family and um, we may not see them as normal, but we do see that there were these women that were strong. And we see these women that had faith. And we see David's mom that was committed. And we honor that. And it speaks to our own lives. It speaks really to our own lives that we are here. And that no matter what we're doing, we're making a difference. We can live with faith. We can live with commitment. We can entrust our everything to Elohim and say, just as David did. He said, I don't know, but I will see and commit my ways into the hands of God and see what he has for me for the future. And with that, let us just close our eyes and let us pray. Father, we just thank you so, so much this evening that we can look into the faith and into the lives of these women and know that, Ever Father, they speak to our hearts. Yes, they were there, Father. Yes, they played a role in so many ways that we don't even maybe know, Father. But Father, it speaks to our hearts to be active and to be willing to do whatever it is that you are calling us to do in our families, in our societies, in our nations, in our communities, in everything, Father. Help us be the people that you created us to be. Help us be the woman that you empowered us to be. Help us be women of faith, Father, women of bold courage and strength. Help us be those people. Father, this evening, whoever is listening, wherever they are, I pray for your blessing of strength. I pray, Father, for your blessing of goodness. I pray for your blessing of purpose. I pray for a fresh vision, Father. I pray that no matter who is working and searching for that breakthrough, that, Father, it will come in you, and it will come in your will, and it will come in your time. Father, I pray against despair or despondency. Father, I pray against against sadness, Father, but that your joy and that your peace and would fill us and that you would uplift us, Yeshua Mashiach, that you'll break off every chain of bondage, every chain of the enemy be gone in Yeshua's name, and that freedom will be fully felt in our lives in every single place of us. Father Yahweh, we praise you. Our Father, we worship you and we give you all of our praise this evening. We thank you and, and Father, lead and guide us this week. Lead and guide us in everything that we do. Now we praise you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really pray that this teaching has really blessed you and has really, really encouraged you. If it has, I want you to know that there are notes because there are things that I've said that were not on the slide. So I want you to know that you can get those notes over on our website, treasuredinheritanceministry.com. 
and that is www.treasuredinheritanceministry.com and you can go over there and get the notes or you can subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can receive other teachings that are very similar to this and other teachings that will just speak to your heart. So thank you again for joining me. I pray that you will have Shavuot Tov. Until next time.